we've got a real spicy video one that really shook up the twitter sphere kind of i thought there was going to be more backlash to this i thought people were going to be more angry but um i don't know it seems like there's a whole lot more rational and calm and theoretically educated people on the left nowadays even in a lot of twitter spaces um, who understood where norman finkelstein was coming from here and you know a lot of people who said like this was a a huge breath of fresh air for them which is how i felt about a lot of finkelstein's commentary lately like in his new book some of it's just kind of um like basic um and and some of the stuff he's saying is just um you know like anthony montero is saying where why weren't you saying this stuff 10 15 years ago i'm pretty sure when we were talking to him. but either way um, a lot of it's been really, really good still. Uh, good critiques of the left, of the post-Bernie left. Um, and he was recently with our friend Sabby Sabs of RBN. Um, so where where she asked him about Angela Davis. Yeah. Do you have anything to say, Carlos, before I just jump into the video? Um, no, I was just getting to uh, some of the comments, some of the questions in the chat. Oh, gotcha. But, um yeah, Montero's been a ahead of the game in, in these critiques for, you know, as 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 long ago as you can possibly be ahead of the game. Um, I I mean, uh, maybe I can make this point when when we're watching the video, but it's important to remember just how much, uh, how how much of an influence the overthrow of the Soviet Union has in a lot of these people's turns. That's something that Montero's always emphasizing with with uh, Gerald Horn. And I think it'd be fair to emphasize it with uh, Angela Davis, um, who was one of the key figures only, along with uh, Ch Charlene Mitchell. And unfortunately, I heard Herbert Aptiker was too, but who basically tried to split the party and, and do uh, the committees of correspondence, go down the route of you know basically explicit social democracy. That's not to say that some of the critiques that they had of the way that the, the party was functioning aren't fair, but, um, you know, that's like party wrecking activities. Uh, and then, you know, then in their career, you just see that reflected in a very compatible form of Marxism. Um, and yeah, so I'll, well, maybe we could say a little more with, uh, with, yeah, uh, let's see what Finkelstein has to say here and then that'll give us more. Awful beyond words is the Angela Davis Roadshow, the uh, prison mm -hmm. abolitionism. Because is prison abolitionism on the historical agenda now? Is that on the agenda? That's why wherever Angela goes now, and believe me, I say this with pain and anguish. Angela Davis was a heroine of my youth. I held her in the highest regard, but what she's turned into same by the way when carlos and i were first getting into socialism we would do these socialist night schools at our at our school and we were teaching classes about the major influential socialist leadership in this country throughout history which is largely you know uh the black panthers uh various civil rights leaders a lot of labor leaders and stuff too but um angela davis was one of them because she became essentially a martyr when she was uh, put or they tried to put her in jail on trumped up charges um, as you know there were a whole bunch of people who weren't so lucky who were thrown in jail or were who or who had to you know seek exile in Cuba or the Soviet Union or whatever um, but the the whole party came out the or the whole Black Panther Party I, I don't know the details completely if the CPUSA and stuff was there but they made a big deal about it um, got the media there uh, turned it into a big spectacle and, and you know, basically faced off head to head with the justice system and won. Um, got the charges dropped against Angela Davis. So someone who was a hero to Carlos and I um, as an American socialist. But that doesn't mean, you know, uh, sh that you can't change, that your politics can't change, that you can't end up serving the ruling class, which is actually what happened to a lot of former communists after the fall of the Soviet Union. And to be fair, like the... Her main book on uh, our prisons, obsolete. I mean, I've read it. It's not like bad. It's good from the the point of view that it's able to trace like um, races, institutions, and how those are related to capital, and it traces it from you know the institution of slavery, the institution of lynching, the institutions of Jim Crow, and the institution of prisons. 
and it's able to draw these connections, which are very interesting um, and, and helpful when we speak about, you know, um, the role of prisons in, in capitalism within the empire. It's awesome for, uh, you know, getting at uh, the hypocrisy of the empire when they speak about authoritarianism in X, Y, or Z place, but we have, you know, 4% of the global population, 25% of the prisoners. Those are disproportionately people of color, of course, um, and, and poor people. Uh, and, you know, it's also helpful from the standpoint of seeing how uh, the prisons have developed their own political economy. That's, you know, if, if there is still a, a productive uh, industry in the U.S. It's largely done by by prison labor. So all of that analysis is it's it's phenomenal. But then to say, okay, um, we need prison abolitionism. It's like, yeah, I mean, we we need at some point the abolition of uh, of the state too. But like, <laughs> we don't even have an organized working class, let alone a revolutionary party. We're nowhere near like overthrowing the capitalist system in the U.S. and overthrowing empire. Like there's to to you know to make your struggle at this moment something that will be achieved once a million other things are won. It's ridiculous. So there is something. There's a kernel that's still positive in Angela Davis and her work on prisons. All of this empirical data is great to know and it's great to use to call out American hypocrisy and to understand. You know this this uh, sphere of production that's often ignored, which is done by prison labor, that's, you know, super exploited to, uh, you know, the, the super exploitation on super exploitation. And, you know, these people are making cents uh, an hour, right? Um, but, you know, it's the prison abolitionism as the project that I, I, I struggle with. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And I, and I think that's what Finkelstein's going to call out here. Yeah. I just want to add on top, like, to fully address the uh, political economy of the prisons. There are also private prisons, although it's not all of them. Um, so they're making money directly. Um, and then these companies like AT&T make money because that's like where you make the, or who you make the phone calls through in prison. Sorry, I'm choking on my tongue right now. Um, <laughs> and then like Aramark is a company that sold the food at the college Carlos and I went to. They make tons of money through the prison system. So um, and they, they all um, have lobbies that they're connected to, too, where they can influence politicians to keep the prisons filled with bodies. Um, so it's become extremely profitable to make sure that the prisons are always filled to the brim. Um, so, of course, there is stuff to critique there. Um, but you'll see what Fingelstein's getting at here. It was simply laughable. Where all these white liberals go to hear her lecture on prison abolitionism, and they all nod their head as Angela and Gina Dent, you know, speak uh, very seriously about this. Of course, because it has no connection with reality. And you get to be with Angela, and you get to talk about, you know, prison abolitionism, which has nothing to do with anything. Prison abolitionism is, if you read Lenin, you know, Lenin's uh, State and Revolution, yes, you eliminate all the repressive forces of society, he said, all the special apparatuses of repression, of which police are, or excuse me, prisons are one. The special apparatuses of, of repression, he said, that doesn't come until, and I'm quoting him now, the highest stage of communism, okay? We're going to eliminate all the special forces of repression. Now I ask you, Sabrina and Angela, if you're listening, are we anywhere near the highest stage of communism? Are we near that? Then what are you talking about? This has nothing to do with anything. It's just hot, a hot ticket item on Martha's Vineyard. Or when she so it's true. And then she goes around to all of these Ivy League universities where people like Amy Gottman, who I knew, this milk toast liberal uh, who taught at Princeton, and then she was the president of U of P. Now she's the American ambassador to Germany. Um, Amy Gottman, Amy Gottman, this milk toast liberal is literally, she is in a state of nirvana, euphoria, introducing Angela Davis, who's going to speak on prison abolitionism. Now, Hold up, Betty, can you pause it? Myself, Sabrina. I, I, yeah, I, I think he goes to another point here that's really good. Um, but I want to tease out a point that, that he, you know, what are we going to do? Say, uh, you know, we win tomorrow uh, and then the proletariat grabs power in the U.S., which is 
if if we're talking seriously, a long ways away. There's so much work that has to be done. But let's say it happens tomorrow. What are you going to do to the billionaires, to the media puppets, to Henry Kissinger, to Henry Kissinger, who's going to fucking survive 130 years because he's a dickhead and dickheads do that. Um, <laughs> what are you going to do to the politicians, all the puppets of, of empire? What are you going to do to all of these, you know, perhaps some of the, the former armed bodies of men who still, you know, see their loyalty with the previous exploiting and oppressing orders. What are you going to do with all of these classes that align themselves with the former exploiting and oppressing and alienating mode of life? What are you going to do with them? You know, you have, you have two options. Either you shoot them all and we're not doing that. We're fucking humanists. You know, we think people can change or you just let them roam around and, overthrow what you succeeded in conquering, which is, you know, political power, power over the state. There's only one thing you could do is have organic proletarian armed bodies of men that can be used to suppress the exploiters once the exploited come to power. That's the essence of the dictatorship of the proletariat, to have this idea that let's abolish the prisons. No! We're going to have to put all the people that are sending millions into prisons now for minor offenses, for, you know, crimes related to the poverty that they force those people into. The people that are the agents, the personification of capital, we're going to have to have those people in prison afterwards. So hell yeah, we'll need prisons and we'll need, you know, uh, police and people's militias. And, you know, the, the people organize themselves as a you know popular form of repressing the old exploiters. Of course, we're going to need that. So you know, just talking about this prison abolition in the abstract, it's so ridiculous. It's something that if it's going to come about, it's going about it's it's, it's going to be right around the time when the socialist state is withering away on its own and with it, all the other institutions. Insofar as there's a state, there's going to have to be repressive state apparatuses because that's the essence of the state. It, it's it's a it's a thing that exists when civil society, when society cannot control the antagonisms that exist within classes. And those contradictions linger on in socialism. They don't just disappear from one day to the next. The old exploiters are still there. There's a good chunk of the population that still aligns its consciousness, its aesthetic sensibilities, and its mode of life with the old order. They don't just disappear. So you're going to have to have a proletarian state, which will be unlike any other state, but we'll still have repressive apparatus for the minority of people that were in the old exploiting classes. That's the essence of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And this turn towards this abstract prison abolitionism, it's not disconnected with her turn following the overthrow of the Soviet Union away from Marxism-Leninism. After we had established the dictatorship of the proletariat, the prisons will wither and will replace them with special farms where Juan Guaido and Henry Kissinger will romp and play and make milk. Um, no, I, I agree with everything you said. That's what I was going to say is that we'll need prisons to put – someone message, or mentioned Kissinger earlier in the chat. We'll need prisons to, to put people like that in them um, unless I volunteer to uh, do a 10-minute wrestling match with Henry Kissinger. I do not think he will make it through it. If I double leg that guy, he would explode into dust. His body would just incinerate on the spot. So, oh my God. I'm dead serious about this. If I were being introduced by, say, George Soros, I really would have some questions about what is it I'm saying that George Soros likes so much? Okay. George Soros and I were both Jewish. But guess what? That's where it begins and that's where it ends. <laughs> Nothing in common. So I have to ask myself, why isn't Angela Davis asking herself, why am I getting all these hysterical, warm receptions from all of these filthy, rich, uh, filthy, rich crook? Why am I getting, I told you the story, you'll forgive me if I'm repeating myself. If you go to YouTube and uh, you can put it up yourself. She spoke, Angela spoke at the University of South Carolina, and she's introduced by this Southern bell with this huge shock of blonde hair, and she happens to be the second richest billionaire in South Carolina. The second richest billionaire in South Carolina. And she introduces Angela only half chokingly, 
half jokingly, she introduces Angela by saying, Angela and I have a lot in common. Angela and I have a lot in common. Okay, you don't have to be a purist, fine. And we have to make a lion, fine. But Angela, don't you pause to think why the second richest billionaire in South Carolina is introducing you? You know what's funny? There's an interview from when she was, I don't remember if it was San Quentin. San Quentin was where, um, uh, where the name is slipping, the, the Blood in My uh, guy. Um, oh, George Jackson. George Jackson, right? Because she should, she's in prison and uh, uh, her incarceration is tied to um, the activities of, of him and his brother, um, of his brother specifically. But there's an interview from when she's in prison and, uh, you know, they ask her about uh, black, the black community and anti-communism. And she tells a story of, a, you know, of a, of a black person who went up to her. He was talking with her and, and he asked her, what, what does communism mean? Uh, I, I see that all of the same basically racist pigs that, you know, keep us uh, uh, oppressed because of, you know, we're black. They hate you because you're a communist, you know, but the fact that they do that, it means that it has to be good. There has to be something good about it. So that was that connection. Like what, what's the ruling class's position to you? And if they're antagonistic to you, almost intuitively, you know, there's, you're doing something good, right? All of the greatest leaders of the, you know, progressive movement in the U S MLK, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Fred Hampton, you know, <laughs> they were far from being friends of the state, you know, or the liberal or uh, uh, conservative bourgeoisie, they were murdered by the apparatuses of the state. And so were other uh, leaders of labor. You know, so um, when when she's like the darling of the, you know, largest ideological apparatuses of the mode of life that we exist in, the darling of academia, the darling of the post-colonial studies and the post-modern and post-Marxist and post all the different posts that dominate the social science departments in, in, in the academy, when she's the darling of the NGOs and, you know, she's forgetting or she's either forgetting or, you know, uh, knowingly uh, knowing what, what precisely what she's doing, which is sending out, you know, if she's the darling of the liberal wing of the bourgeoisie, which is the one that's most successful in proliferating the existing order and proliferating imperialism, um, the same logic applies to her. She's they're not antagonistic to her. So she's not dangerous. She's she's not to be supported. She's not good. Right. Um, and I'm not saying it would be easy to go through all that struggle and then see the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, the biggest blow to global global communism in history and continue, you know, organizing and not sell out. Like we said, a lot of these people um, old school communists basically did become liberals, but I mean, as easy it is, as it is to harp on them, I would rather elevate someone who didn't do that, Anthony Montero, a doc, uh, Professor Anthony Montero, who we spoke to recently, who was organizing, you know, who's who's one of our um, forefathers, or you know, um, one of these people who was who organized with a lot of these legends. Um, of the communist and civil rights movement. And still today, he's doing the same thing. He's educating, you know, group, uh, groups of young people on Marxism, Leninism, and bestowing upon us, I would almost say, all of his knowledge and his experience from, you know, the years being involved in the struggle. Um, so, yeah, I, I just want to elevate Dr. Montero as an example um, of, of one of these sort of American communist legends who's still still around, still doing it, who didn't sell out, despite how tempting that would be. You know, if you struggle your whole life um, and, you know, you get excluded from academic opportunities, you get blackballed from the media, you get, you know, harassed by the justice system and the legal system. It'd be so easy after the fall of the Soviet Union to just say, screw it. I'm going to be a liberal. I'm going to take some nice paychecks and I'm going to retire. But you have these people like Michael Parenti and Montero, and I'm sure they've suffered financially for it, uh, who refuse to do that. Who, I mean, Montero was fired from his job, uh, like recently, 
for being a communist. Um, so, yeah, they, they absolutely suffered financially for it, but um, they continue to stay in the struggle. And it's just... You know, you got to have respect for that when you see someone who used to, or, you know, who we view, viewed at one point, at least as a great hero of the communist movement, like Angela Davis drifting towards liberalism. Um, it shows how easy it is. Um, we I all wanna, have combat opportunism. I want to address uh, real quick a comment by Ellen Degenerate. This isn't true, Carlos. There are plenty of class traders to the bourgeoisie, Angles being the most obvious. Yeah, but what you don't have is... The institutions of the bourgeoisie becoming traitors to the bourgeoisie. There's a difference between a class trader and you know a a a billionaire that's friendly to the workers' movement or a millionaire that's friendly to the workers' movement, and then the whole stratum of liberal billionaires being friendly to your work and all of their institutions, which are primarily the ones that dominate the ideological apparatuses of of the U.S. Right, the academy. They're all friendly to her work. So we're not talking about one rich person or a small amount of rich people that love Angela. We're talking about the institutions that allow the ideology of the bourgeoisie to proliferate itself in our historical moment. They love Angela Davis. It's just objective. You know, it's you go in, you'll see it. <laughs> I'm in those spaces. I can tell you, I can guarantee it. Yeah, there's some, you know, conservative nuts in some parts of uh of 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 the the country's institutions which you know um which consider her the devil still but the vast majority of the bourgeoisie and bourgeois ideologues today and their institutions do not they consider her you know uh you know this wonderful commodity that they can bring around to their lecture halls and and just show off and you know get the sort of radical aura that comes with her the radical aura. I like that. I like what he was describing the lady in a state of nirvana and euphoria introducing because that is how liberals do speaking engagements, dude. They're always like, welcome to our talk about flowers and sniffing our own farts. Um, <laughs> I like this comment. I'm pulling a reverse Davis over here. <laughs> Going from liberal to Marxist Leninist. I love it. Love to see it. Uh, Dr. Ant Dr. Anthony Montero has been a mentor to many of us. I've really enjoyed your interview with him. You should have him on again soon. I agree. I would love to have him on. Uh, 